Good morning, Grace. Let's stand and let's worship today.
that's our prayer today. We just give it back to you. Open our hearts and our minds as we go into this message, as we go throughout the rest of our day. We love you, Lord. It's in your name we pray. Amen. You guys can be seated. All right, good morning. We are here to lift up the name of Jesus, to worship Jesus. That's what we do in chapel. I'm thankful to our chapel band. Can we give it up for them one more time for their ministry to us? Thank you. And we're going to continue to worship the name of Jesus uh, this morning as we study uh, God's word. Our speaker this morning is Pastor Aaron Hoke. He uh, has received his bachelor's degree from Kentucky Wesleyan College and MDiv from Westminster Seminary in California. He pastors Grace Baptist Church right here in Warsaw. It's a church he planted back in 2010. Pastor Aaron, his name spelled A-A-R-O-N, is married to his wife, who is also named Aaron, spelled E-R-I-N. That's, that's fun, right? They have five kids, all boys, two in college, two in high school, and one in elementary. Ryan, Andrew, who is here, a student here, Mitchell, Zachary, and Lucas. He enjoys spending time with his family, reading, watching sports, especially Clemson and the Cubs, and going to his kids' events. Yeah, some Cubs fans. All right, please help me welcome to the stage Pastor Aaron Hoke. Thanks, Brent. Thank you for the invitation to speak and for welcoming me to your chapel today. I am genuinely grateful for the impact of the Grace College community on the life of my son, who is a freshman here. He believes, I hear you, O3. O <laughs> um, he believes transformation has happened in his life since he arrived at Grace and we see it. And I thank God for your part in that as the community of believers that has surrounded him and loved him well. And I don't know when I'm ever gonna have this many Grace College people in one room to talk to listening to me, so I wanna say for my wife and I, thank you. If you've got a Bible or maybe your phone with a Bible app on it, you can turn with me to Genesis 37 this morning. Genesis 37, if I say to you, the lion of the tribe of Judah, do you know who I'm talking about? Jesus, Jesus. that's right, I didn't even have to wait. Good, yes, I'm talking about Jesus who is called the lion of the tribe of Judah, Revelation 5.5, 5. weep no more, behold the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David has conquered. There is something about that title the lion of the tribe of Judah that inspires confidence. We think of conquering power. We think of victory. We like that title. It fits our savior Jesus so well, the lion of the tribe of Judah. But I want you to think with me for a moment this morning about the tribe of Judah part. Given what we know about the lion, of the tribe of Judah, we might think similar things about Judah. We might think that our magnificent savior comes from a magnificent line of ancestors. Surely Judah was a great, mighty lion of a man. But if we thought that, we would be wrong. In fact, we could pick almost anyone in the genealogy of Jesus all of his descendants, to show that that is not the case, to show that the glorious Savior Christ actually comes from a line of not at all glorious ancestors. They are all sinners of various kinds, some more striking and ugly than others, some more ordinary, but all sinners in need of the very Savior in whose line they stood. And that was certainly true of Judah. And what I want us to see today is the remarkable transforming grace of God in the life of Judah. 
Judah was one of the 12 sons of Israel. I'm going to get to that in a minute. Uh, let's, let's go back to Jesus for a second. You know, Jesus was descended from David, and, and David was from the tribe of Judah. And Judah was a descendant going backwards of his father Jacob and his grandfather Isaac and his great-grandfather Abraham. Jesus came from the line of Judah, Hebrews 7, 14. For it is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah. There's no disputing that. He came from the tribe of Judah. So what about this Judah? Again, I want us to see the remarkable transforming grace of God in his life and why that should give every single person in this room, me included, why it should give all of us humility and hope. I sometimes think we see giants of the faith and think that either in our pride we're like them, I'm going to be the next David. Or we think in our despair, our weakness, our hopelessness, that we will never be a great Moses or David or Apostle Paul. But Moses, David, and Paul all had their significant flaws. And Judah? Judah is a complete mess. He's a train wreck. He's a disaster. And I want us to see that today. Which is to say... He's a lot like us. And I hope the story of Judah, given in really short order this morning, will give you hope and promote humility in us. We are weak and flawed, much like Judah was. So let's have a look at his life this morning. We're going to start in Genesis 37, and we're going to make our way through several chapters of Genesis. So buckle up. All right? We're going to do a lot of history in a short period of time. And if your eyes are glazing over at the thought of history, hang with me. It'll be worth it. The payoff, I trust, by God's grace, will be worth it. So we got to do some history to get some of the the benefit out of the life of Judah. His life we could summarize with an ugly start and a sweet finish by the grace of God. So we, we start with that ugly start. And to get us to Judah, you got to do a little background to make sure we're all up on our Old Testament history. We talked about how he was one of the 12 sons of Jacob. Jacob is the one that was renamed Israel. And that's what the, the people of God were called in the Old Covenant, Israel. Israelites, the people of Israel, they were named for Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel. Jacob was descended before him from Abraham and his father Isaac. Jacob had 12 sons. They became the 12 tribes of Israel. Judah is one of those 12. It's important for this story to remember that those 12 sons, while they had one father, Jacob, there were actually four different mothers. Jacob had four wives, and among the four, he had a favorite. His favorite wife was Rachel, and he had two sons by Rachel, and they were Joseph and Benjamin. This is all important background. You can do it. Hang with me, all right? Joseph and Benjamin were born to Jacob by Rachel. Listen, there are three J names in this story today. There's Jacob, the dad, there's Judah, and there's Joseph. And I, I tell my church this, I, like, I'm going to get them wrong today. I'm going to say one, and I'm going to mean another, and you're going to go, I think you meant... Just roll with me, because you'll know who I'm at, all right? So anyway, Jacob's got four wives. His favorite, Rachel, has two sons, Joseph and Benjamin. Remember that, the favorite wife had two sons. Now, that brings us to Genesis 37. If you're going to follow along, we're going to start at verse 2 and read through verse 4. Not very much, just to start with here. This is, though, the word of the living God. Genesis 37, 2. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph being 17 years old, was pastoring the flock with his brothers. He was a boy with the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any other of his sons because he was the son of his old age. And he made him a robe of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. 
So Jacob played favorites, not just with his wives, but with his sons too. And so one of the sons of his favorite wife was his favorite son, Joseph. Listen, this is free. This is not why I'm preaching this passage, but while we're here, don't do that. Don't show favoritism. Don't have more than one wife. Start there. (laughs) But then, if you've got more than one kid, don't show favoritism. I don't have time to preach that, but just don't. I've got five boys. They know if you play favorites. These sons knew and they hated Joseph for it. They probably hated him because he tattled on them too that we just read there. And remember, Judah is one of these 12 brothers. So Judah hates Joseph. How much did they hate him? They couldn't speak peacefully with him. They couldn't say shalom to him. They hated their brother so much. That was made worse when Joseph had a couple of dreams that indicated that one day he would be in power over them and they would bow down to him. The problem was Joseph didn't keep those dreams to himself. He thought he would share them with his brother. Another tip, if you have a dream that shows you exalted everyone, don't share that either. Joseph does. His brothers hate him even more for that. They're like, no, 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 we already hate you. You're not going to be in power over us. Look at verses 8 and 11. His brother said to him, are you, after he told him the dreams, are you indeed to reign over us? Or are you indeed to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. And then down in verse 11, and his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the saying in mind. Their hatred and jealousy then boil over into a plot to kill him. This isn't just being annoyed with your little brother. They really hate him. And Jesus says, murder comes out of the heart that hates. And here it does. A plot to murder. Look at verse 18. They saw him, Joseph, from afar. And before he came near to them, they conspired against him to kill him. They said to one another, here comes this dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we'll say that a fierce animal has devoured him. And we will see what will become of his dreams. But when Reuben heard it, he rescued him out of their hands, saying, Let us not take his life. And Reuben said to them, Shed no blood, throw him into this pit here in the wilderness, but do not lay a hand on him, that he might rescue him out of their hand to restore him to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe. Judah is in this group, remember? Okay? They stripped him of his robe. I lost my place. The robe of many colors that he wore, and they took him and threw him into a pit. The pit was empty. There was no water in it. Then they sat down to eat. Throw your brother in a pit to die and go have dinner. It's sort of shocking, their cruelty and their hatred towards Joseph. But Jake, Judah, Judah, this is the Judah that we're talking about today. Judah hatches a plan We'll look down at verse 25 now. Then they sat down to eat, and looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels bearing gum, balm, and myrrh on their way to carry it down to Egypt. Then Judah said to his brothers, what profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers listened to him. Then Midianite traders passed by, and they drew Joseph up and lifted him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. They took Joseph to Egypt. They sold their brother into slavery for silver. Now, technically, Judah saves Joseph's life here. But selling someone into slavery for your own financial profit and consigning them to a life of servitude and misery separated from your family is not doing him a favor. Kept him alive, but Judah is wicked. It's cruel. This is the Judah that we're talking about today. But that's not all. They've just rid themselves of Joseph, but now they've got to do something about dad. This is dad's favorite son. So... Look over at verse 31. 
Then they took Joseph's robe and slaughtered a goat and dipped the robe in blood. And they sent the robe of many colors and brought it to their father and said, This we have found. Please identify whether it is your son's robe or not. And he identified it and said, It is my son's robe. A fierce animal has devoured him. Joseph is without doubt torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his garments and put sackcloth on his loins and mourned for his son many days. All his sons and all his daughters rose up to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted and said, No, I shall go down to Sheol mourning for my son. Thus his father wept for him. They devastate their father with the news that Joseph has been devoured by a wild animal. They lie to him. And then they dis- this is disgusting. They, they, they try to comfort him. You know what would have comforted Jacob? Was telling him Joseph was alive. Going to get him, maybe. But instead, for 20 years, they cover up what they did with Joseph. It's cruel, it's cold, and it's heartless. But hang on. Judah gets worse. Chapter 38 is one of the chapters that we, if we're honest, wish wasn't in our Bibles. It makes us uncomfortable. It's about Judah and his wickedness. We don't have time to do all of Judah or Genesis 38. But he marries a Canaanite woman. That's a bad idea. He has three sons. Uh, we just don't have time to do it. I'm going to run out of time. He's got three sons. The first two die. The first one had a wife when he died. Her name was Tamar. They didn't have any kids. So the second son of Judah took Tamar as his wife. No children. He dies. Because of their wickedness, those sons died, by the way. Maybe that's some bad parenting on Judah's part. We don't know. But then Judah promises to his daughter-in-law, Tamar, that he'll give her his third son when he's old enough. He has no intention of doing that. He thinks Tamar is the reason his first two sons have died. And so Judah now, he's got two dead sons. He's got one living son. He's like, no way is this cursed daughter-in-law getting anywhere near my son. She figures out he has no intention of keeping his promises. And no joke, she dresses like a harlot, a prostitute, to ensnare Judah, her father-in-law, and at work. Look at verse 15. Chapter 38, verse 15. When Judah saw her, he thought she was a prostitute, for she had covered her face. He turned to her at the roadside and said, come, let me come in to you, for he did not know that she was his daughter-in-law. And they, they haggle about the price and the pledge, and so the end of verse 18, so he gave them to her and went into her, and she conceived by him, and they have twins. Twins are born to Judah and his daughter-in-law. This is Judah. Foolish marriage, maybe bad parenting, lying, lust, incest. That's the guy we're talking about. Judah and his brothers go and his father go 20 years without Joseph in their lives until a severe famine strikes. They're forced to go to Egypt to buy grain. Why is there grain for sale in Egypt in a famine? You guys doing okay? A lot of history. You awake? You with me? A lot of history crammed into a short period of time. All right, got a little ways to go. Why is there grain for sale in Egypt during a famine? Glad you asked. We don't have time to tell the whole story, but it has to do with Joseph. He's the governor. That's right. Joseph is now the governor of Egypt. He was sold into slavery into Egypt for 13 years. He was enslaved. Part of that time he was in prison, but then because of his God-given dream interpreting ability, he comes to Pharaoh's attention. Pharaoh's had some dreams, Joseph interprets them, and they find out there's seven years of plenty coming, lots of grain and abundance, followed by seven years of severe famine. Joseph's got a plan to deal with that. He pitches it to Pharaoh. Pharaoh says, you're in charge. He goes from literally prison to power in Egypt in about an hour. You read about it, it's really remarkable. We don't have time to read that today. So when the famine comes, they've got all this grain stored up in Egypt, and when the famine comes, people from surrounding nations come as well to buy grain. 
including his brothers. And they come and they bow down to him just as his dream had foretold, the one that he told them early on. But only 10 of the remaining 11 brothers come. Only 10 of the 11 remaining brothers come to Egypt to buy grain. Why? Because Jacob is still at home playing favorites. If Joseph is out of the picture, who's his new favorite son? Benjamin. Benjamin. The other one that was born to his favorite wife, Rachel. So Jacob says, no way are you taking Benjamin down to Egypt. Something bad might happen to him. Look in chapter, we're going to jump all the way over to chapter 42, all right? Chapter 42, verses 3 through 6. So 10 of Joseph's brothers went down to buy grain in Egypt, but Jacob did not send Benjamin, Joseph's brother, with his brothers, for he feared that harm might happen to him. Thus the sons of Israel came to buy among the others who came, for the famine was in the land of Canaan. Now Joseph was governor over the land. He was the one who sold to all the people of the land, and Joseph's brothers came and bowed themselves before him with their faces to the ground. When the brothers arrive, they don't recognize Joseph, and he doesn't let on that he does recognize them. And then unfolds this fascinating series of events that we simply do not have time for this morning. Essentially, Joseph is testing his brothers to see if their hearts have changed before he reveals himself to them. Joseph wants reconciliation. He wants shalom restored. But he needs to see if they've changed. So he sends them home with grain and with a demand that they bring their younger brother. That's Benjamin. That's his full blood brother. They share the same father and mother. The demand that they bring their younger brother back or there will be no more grain for them. He also keeps one brother, Simeon, imprisoned in Egypt as a leverage point to make sure that they all come back. That's all fine except for Jacob. In his favoritism, the sons get back with the grain. They say, we got to take Benjamin back if we want to get Simeon back and, and get more grain. And Jacob says no. Look at the end of chapter 42, verse 38. But he said, my son shall not go down with you, for his brother is dead, Joseph. And he, Benjamin, is the only one left. He's got, he's got ten sons standing in front of him. And he says, he says, Benjamin's the only one left. Now he's talking about the only son of Rachel, but man, don't do that. If harm should happen to him on the journey that you are to make, you would bring down my gray hairs with sorrow to shield. And so they can't go. But then that's the, that's the ugly start to Judah's life. I want to shift quickly now to the sweet finish. Joseph and his brothers know once their grain ran, runs out, they'll die without more. So they talk their dad into it. Like, Look, all of us, including your favorite Benjamin, are going to die if we don't go get more grain. He's like, all right, go ahead, get more grain. And they go. Judah, instead of wanting to sell Benjamin like he did with Joseph, actually offers to take personal responsibility. This is what convinces Joseph or Jacob to let him go. Verse 8, this is Genesis 43 now, man. We are just speeding along. Genesis 43, verse 8. And Judah said to Israel, his father, Listen to, listen to how different this is than the way he treated Joseph. Send the boy with me, and we will arise and go that we may live and not die, both we and you and also our little ones. I will be a pledge of his safety. From my hand you shall require him. If I do not bring him back to you and set him before you, then let me bear the blame forever. If we had not delayed, we would have now returned twice. Sounds quite different than Judah who said, let's sell Joseph into slavery for some silver, doesn't it? Now he's saying, look, dad, my life for his, I promise I will bring him back safely. If, you, if we don't, it's on me. Change is happening slowly but surely, and then comes radical transformation. The brothers go buy grain and bow down again before Joseph. He gives Simeon back to him, and he has one last test. He gives them their grain but he frames Benjamin for the theft of his silver cup. The proof is irrefutable. 
Joseph tells the men that the penalty for this theft will be enslavement for Benjamin. Rest of you can go free and go back to your dad. And here's the test. How will they treat Benjamin? Will they leave him as a slave in Egypt? Or will they go to bat for him? And Judah, remember everything we said about Judah. Judah gives one of the most remarkable speeches in all of the New Testament, one of the longest speeches in Genesis. And I do not have time to read it all for you. Just come to, the, he, he, he rehearses with Joseph how it's going to break his father's heart. Now he's concerned for his father Jacob instead of saying, sorry about Joseph, dad. He's like, it will, it will kill my dad if we don't come back with Benjamin. Look at verse 30. We're in chapter 44 now, 44 and verse 30. Now, therefore, he's talking to Joseph, Judah is, as soon as I come to your servant, my father, and the boy is not with us, as his life is bound up in the boy's life, as soon as he sees that the boy is not with us, he will die. And your servants will bring down the gray hairs of your servant, our father, with sorrow to Sheol. For your servant became a pledge of safety. So he tells him about that now. Look at verse 33. Now, therefore, please let your servant remain instead of the boy. He's talking about himself. Let me remain instead of the boy as a servant to my Lord and let the boy go back with his brothers. For how can I go back to my father if the boy is not with me? I fear to see the evil that would find my father. Same Judah. This is nothing short of miraculous. Judah doesn't throw Benjamin under the bus. He doesn't discount his father's anticipated grief. Judah offers himself as a substitute to take the place of Benjamin under the punishment of this Egyptian ruler. You know what that sounds like to me? It doesn't sound like Judah. It sounds like the lion of the tribe of Judah who offered himself to take the place of his people under the just wrath and punishment of God. What in the world has happened to Judah? The remarkable, transforming grace of God found Judah. That's what nothing else could account for this change. This man who sold Joseph, the favorite son, into slavery, not caring how it impacted his father, is now himself willing to be made a slave so that Benjamin, the new favorite son, might go free. And his father might be spared such sorrow and even death. That is only God's grace. And friends, that is a picture of our Savior who has descended from this Judah. And that Savior is the only reason Judah had any hope of forgiveness for all of his wretched sin. And he is our only hope too. So where do you find yourself today? I got, this says four minutes, that says six. I like that one. Um, where do you find yourself today? I want to encourage you in two ways, humility and hope. First, humility. We might want to think, I thank you, Lord, that I'm not like other sinners, not like Judah. And if God has spared you from that darkness, an ugly kind of sin like Judah, indeed, praise him. But it is only by his grace that you are not like Judah. Because if we for a moment think that we are better or will be more useful to God than Judah because we are more upright or gifted or better or whatever. We need a check on our hearts and motives. God does not need your self-righteousness, your great skill, boldness, and giftedness. He can take the messiest, messed up people like Judah and use them to accomplish his good, perfect plan. He shows his great skill and power and our weakness and humility. He gives us the righteousness of Christ because ours is frankly disgusting. 1 Corinthians 1, 26 to 31. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even the things that are not, to bring to nothing the things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus 
who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. I imagine there are very gifted and godly people in this room, and I sincerely pray God uses all of you greatly for his purpose in his kingdom. But it will not be because of you or me. Whether you have standout sort of righteousness and gifts or just kind of ordinary middle of the road or you're an absolute mess like Judah today isn't so much the point. It's that God, by his power, is the one at work in all things in our lives. Your hope must not be on your obedience or giftedness, but rather on God. Give him the glory in all things. With Judah, it was obviously God. Nothing good could have come from Judah, that's true with all of us. It's just not always as obvious. Judah's story calls us to humility. Secondly, really quick, hope. If you're a believer in this Jesus we've spoken of, maybe you are, but maybe your life is still a mess. Maybe you went to bed last night determined to do better today, and you've already blown it this morning. You've got your whole future stretching before you, but it's not bright and hopeful. It's bleak because you keep messing it up. Like Judah kept messing his life up. Let me just encourage you that God delights to transform messes like you and me and make them instruments in his hand to accomplish his good purpose. There is hope, there is forgiveness, there is strength and usefulness for you through Jesus who is descended from Judah and Tamar. If he can transform a Judah... He can transform you. It might be painful. It was for Judah. It might expose you in ways that are hard, but it will be good. I can promise you there is hope this morning because it does not depend on you. It depends on God, the mighty lion of the tribe of Judah. Maybe you think you're so far gone that there's no hope or forgiveness or salvation for you at all. And here you are at a Christian college, and so everybody thinks you're a Christian, and you're afraid to let on otherwise. Don't be afraid. Judah was an angry, bitter, envious, hateful, lustful, wicked man. And God turned him into a humble, selfless, loving, caring servant of God. He can change you too. Cry out to him and he will. The lion of the tribe of Judah has come. It was good news for Judah and it's good news for you. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the Savior, Jesus, our Lion. May we find our hope in him. We pray that you would make us humble, and we pray that you would make us hopeful in you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times. In every way, the Lord of peace be with you all. You're dismissed.